There's been a massive leak relating to Microsoft documentation on new Xboxes, both mid-gen refreshes and next generation. Uh, additionally, game title launches, expected revenue for those titles, uh, dreams of buying Nintendo as an extreme example of one of the email leaks, and plenty more. And all of this comes from the FTC case where Microsoft and the FTC were battling it out recently. And uh, there, was, there was a bit of an accident where several of the documents were leaked unredacted. So that's how we get to today's leaks, where this is not like rumors through the rumor mill. This is like straight from Microsoft, wasn't supposed to be public, but now is. Now, in a public statement posted from the FTC's Office of Public Affairs, the FTC stated very clearly that this was Microsoft's fault. It said, quote, Microsoft was responsible for the error in uploading these documents to the court in a statement to NBC which is about as direct as you can get. So uh, we're going to go through a lot of this stuff. Bear in mind uh, for a couple things. First of all, there is a massive amount of documentation. Secondly, not all of this is officially announced. So some of the stuff in these leaks will have potentially changed dates or timelines or prices, but still tons of interesting stuff. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Swappable Blade Fans, available in 120 and 140 millimeter sizes. The new Thermaltake fans include three sets of swappable blades so that even as you change builds or cases, you can ensure the LEDs are always presented on their best side. The swappable blades allow builders to get the fan frame out of the way of the lights by reversing the blade direction to reconfigure the fan as push or pull while keeping the struts relatively hidden and keeping the fan frame oriented one way. Swapping blades is done by applying pressure evenly to opposite sides, then pressing until the click. Each fan also has pin-to-pad connections for cableless daisy chaining, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. We're going to get straight into it. So first up, there's new consoles that were detailed in a document dated April of 2022. So the document uh, notes that there's going to be a mid-gen refresh of both the Series X and Series S with a new die-shrunk silicon that also includes updates to the design, more storage, and uh, they're also, quote, now adorably all digital. Yes. Adorable. That last one means Microsoft is planning on killing the optical drive in its consoles, at least the built-in ones, so that the delivery of games is now entirely captured. Uh, adorably, of course. The Series X refresh is codenamed Brooklyn and is more of a tube shape rather than anything resembling a box. We'd call it the X-tube. No, no, wait, that's probably taken. Don't go there. Let's go with the X-cylinder. Doesn't really have quite the rain to it. Anyway, it'll feature new 6 nanometer silicon, faster Wi-Fi 6E, 2 terabytes of internal storage, and Xbox Wireless 2. Finally, we have the long-awaited sequel to Wireless 1. Power consumption is reduced by 15% overall, and low-power standby mode will only use 20% of the power that the current Series S does in its standby mode. The updated Series S, codename Elwood, as shown, is a much more subtle update, mostly resembling the current version. There's no mention of new silicon outside of the south bridge for I.O., but it'll come with one terabyte of internal storage. According to the leak, the mid-gen refresh consoles are planned to be announced in June of 2024. Launch is reportedly targeted for August of 2024 per Microsoft's own documents. Now, that's for the Series S refresh at $300, uh, and that's October 2024 for the Series X refresh, which itself will be targeted at $500, and we have some information at the end in leaked emails about hardware subsidies for Microsoft's uh, Xboxes previously as well. As for a real next-gen Xbox, a true successor, Microsoft indicates that that won't be coming until 2028, so about five years away. There aren't any images or renders of a 10th generation Xbox, as it were. Uh, the hardware design should have only just started at this point and that's at least according to this production timeline that was also leaked. Microsoft wants the new console to be a, quote, hybrid game platform capable of leveraging the combined power of the client and cloud. The idea to offload some, but not all, compute to the cloud has been floating around for a while, but as far as we know, it hasn't been truly done in gaming like this. The implications of that are deeply concerning when it comes to longevity of the games and the platform itself. Entire aspects of games could disappear once that part of the service is dropped, or they could just be rendered completely unplayable uh, or made at least objectively worse. 
Microsoft is seriously considering moving to an ARM 64 based CPU architecture instead of x86 with Zen 6. Another interesting takeaway from the slide is that the CPU will balance between big and little cores, regardless of ARM 64 or Zen 6, implying itself that Zen 6 will be a heterogeneous architecture. So in this way, it's also sort of an AMD leak, at least if that assumption turns out to be correct. We don't know what Microsoft actually decided, but we'd bet on sticking with an all AMD semi-custom design. If Xbox moved to ARM, it would likely mean backwards compatibility would have to be handled by an emulator or be abandoned altogether. On top of that, it would mean giving up at least relatively easy porting between Xbox and PC for game developers. The GPU will be AMD based regardless of Microsoft's choice of CPU, either co-designed with AMD or just a licensed Navi 5 design. There's also a bullet point for an NPU, which we think means neural processing unit, as in neural networks and machine learning. This indicates that Microsoft is betting on future games calling for generative AI capabilities in the hardware. This slide shows off all the various ways that the company wants to integrate machine learning into the console. The listed applications include super resolution upscaling, content generation like in-game dialogue, safety moderation, and even monetization improvement. We're actually a little surprised that that last one wasn't already an established project when this slide was put together, or at least higher on the list. But hey, it's not like they're Unity. Xbox also has a new version of its controller plant, codenamed Sebeli. Pronunciation aside, it's the same basic shape and layout as the Xbox Series controller, but with changes under the hood. It'll have the new Xbox Wireless 2 connection and the ability to connect directly to the cloud, presumably for use with the Xbox Game Streaming app, or possibly for latency benefits. This is the same as how the Stadia controller works to interface directly with your cloud instance via the internet, sort of, until they turned it off anyway. Other changes include updated haptic feedback that can double as a speaker, a built-in accelerometer for gyroscopic input, quieter buttons, and a lift to wake functions. The slide also touts more of a focus on sustainability and repair with increased use of recycled materials, modular thumbsticks, and keeping the battery accessible. The new controller is marked to launch at the end of May 2024 for $70. As a final note on the hardware, this slide showing the status of various projects within Xbox indicates that a handheld gaming device is not in scope to be completed by 2030. This is somewhat in contrast to another slide showing a handheld alongside the consoles. That said, the as yet unseen project Keystone cloud only console is there too. And obviously between now and 2030 is a lot of years. So Microsoft may look at this growing handheld market and determine, you know what, actually that is worth trying to get some of. The next slide features ZeniMax's forecasted game title launches followed by some revenue projections for those games. It's actually pretty interesting because it indicates the company's sort of belief in the performance of each of those titles. It's got things like Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 on there. Now, this slide is from 2020. It's from before the Microsoft acquisition of ZeniMax. Uh, so obviously some of the information is not up to date. Starfield, as a great example, ended up being delayed a year, and therefore the release target for DLC would also be delayed at least a year because uh, they didn't ship the DLC before the game. So, uh, and then Test 6 also will miss its original launch projection, but we can still go through it. The noteworthy titles include these. For fiscal year 2022, which ZeniMax had ending December 31st, so 2022, the company plans to launch uh, an unspecified but previously leaked Indiana Jones game, an Oblivion remaster, so we'd assume that's soon since it's a year late now, an Elder Scrolls Online expansion, Starfield DLC, again, they were delayed around a year on Starfield, so the DLC will maybe probably ship next year if ZeniMax sticks to its original spacing. For fiscal year 2023, they noted Doom Year Zero and its DLC as the launch plan, uh, Project Kestrel, which as far as we know right now of filming, uh, is an unknown title or IP. Elder Scrolls Online expansion once again. Project Platinum, also unknown. And then for fiscal year 2024, they list the Elder Scrolls 6. Now, a couple things here. In late August, as in very recently, uh, Bethesda noted that they had just started early development for the Elder Scrolls 6. Now, for 2024, they also have a planned launch of an unnamed licensed IP game, unless they've gone full meta, and that's just the name of the game itself. A Fallout 3 remaster is also on the roster, as is another test online expansion, a sequel to Ghostwire Tokyo, Dishonored 3, which probably will get some love in the audience, 
and another Doom Year Zero DLC. This slide also contains the revenue projections for many of these titles and some other ones. Uh, the numbers are interesting because, once again, they give us insight into what the company, ZeniMax plus Bethesda at the time, uh, prior to the acquisition, thought would be successful and how successful they thought it would be. And that indicates potential future plans for each of the titles. The most interesting projection from the 2020 slide is the Elder Scrolls VI at $1,000 million, or a billion dollars. We assume that's not a placeholder, it's a pretty clean number, but the total at the bottom adding up to $2.35 billion does in fact include that $1,000 million or $1 billion entry. As a reference, Business Insider reported in 2013 that GTA V became the fastest game to make $1 billion, which was achieved within days, so it is possible. Remember that these year marks are off as well, since Starfield and Test 6 have both been delayed, although Starfield has now launched. Now, the Elder Scrolls Online is shown as trending down annually, with a big drop aligning with Bethesda's original Test 6 launch date. That makes sense. Starfield, meanwhile, is projected to lose steam rapidly after its second year on the market, but was the second biggest year one projection on this entire table. ZeniMax also seems to have had high hopes for Doom Year Zero at $455 million for its projected launch, Project Kestrel at $280 million, and our favorite game here at the office, Licensed IP Game, at $225 million for their first years. And again, these may have shifted a bit. As a fun footnote, ZeniMax also projected that revenue from free-to-play games would multiply annually with a slight slowdown in fiscal year 2024 aligning with the launch of Elder Scrolls VI, which if they classified tests online as free to play, maybe that's some of that change, but go figure that free to play games can be projected to bring in $275 million in revenue for a year. One of the more heavily headlined leaks from the whole Microsoft FTC thing was a set of emails, including some from Phil Spencer, talking about the acquisition of Nintendo, or the potential acquisition of it. The first email we're going to look at is one from Chris Kaposala, the CMO, sent to Takashi Numoto, the corporate VP of Cloud and Enterprise, and to Phil Spencer, the CEO of Microsoft Gaming. The CMO spoke in 2020 of TikTok, quote, falling into our lap, noting that it happened as a result of TikTok attempting to avoid a ban in the U.S. You may remember this discussion around 2020. The executive mentioned a price target of 10 to 30 billion for one of its next consumer asset acquisitions. In a separate email from Phil Spencer, also speaking of acquisitions, the Microsoft Gaming head notes that Nintendo is, quote, the prime asset for us in gaming, and today gaming is our most likely path to consumer relevance. Interestingly here, implying that Microsoft may not necessarily see itself as particularly relevant uh, to consumers, maybe more of just a fact of life. Spencer also spoke of stock acquisitions. Nintendo is publicly traded in Japan. and the email, he talks about board of director positions and pushing for more revenue, uh, saying that Nintendo is sitting on a pile of cash. The email talks strategy for a path to acquisition and notes, quote, I don't see an angle to a near-term mutually agreeable merger of Nintendo and Microsoft, and I don't think a hostile action would be a good move, so we're playing the long game. But our board of directors has seen the full write-up on Nintendo and Valve, and they are fully supportive on either if opportunity arises, as am I. Now, first of all, yes. Yes, hostile takeovers generally not regarded positively, uh, hence the hostility that's in the name of it. Uh, but speaking of acquisitions of shares and board positions does set up sort of that subtext. And if you're not aware, a hostile takeover is a certain type of acquisition in the corporate world. Now, Spencer continued saying, quote, confidentially, we have two fairly active merger and acquisitions discussions in gaming right now, Warner Brothers Interactive and ZeniMax. I took ZeniMax to the board of directors last week, and prior to the board of directors discussion, I asked Amy and Satya if they wanted me to slow either or both of these given the TikTok discussions, and they both emphatically told me no. Unfortunately, neither of them handed Spencer a book on how commas work, which is not a required skill to be a CEO at Microsoft Gaming. There's some more discussion about various pros and cons of Warner Brothers and ZeniMax, but the most interesting line in this email is at the end, quote, at some point, getting Nintendo would be a career moment, and I honestly believe a good move for both companies. It's just taken a long time for Nintendo to see that their future exists off of their own hardware. A long time. Punctuated with a friendly, hostile takeover smiley face. Obviously, these are internal emails. It doesn't change the fact, though, that this entire sentence is just pure pride. Uh, uh, we're not only speaking of career moments, 
but also assigning Nintendo its own future and what it does or doesn't realize about its own future. So it seems unlikely Nintendo, in general, just sort of uh, our opinions here talking in the office about it, seems very unlikely Nintendo would want to sell. It's a very old company. Uh, it started with like playing cards or something and it's made it a long time and is, is very wealthy as a company and also seems to have uh, its own pride with its hardware and its IP. So that seems unlikely. Uh, after seeing this, though, and the mention of a hostile takeover, if at any point Nintendo did consider selling to Microsoft, it would seem like now maybe the price would go up. Another leaked email was about Baldur's Gate 3. Well, it was about games in general coming up and what Microsoft thought those games might demand in order to be included on the Game Pass service. Uh, and it also ranked those games by their expected popularity and what they intended to achieve. Baldur's Gate 3 was one of them. Now, Baldur's Gate 3 is one of the year's most successful and wildly well-liked games. Seems to be very highly respected amongst the gaming community at large. Uh, it, however, was also snubbed by Microsoft uh, prior to its launch. Microsoft's leaked documents classified Baldur's Gate 3 as, quote, a second-run Stadia RPG. Ouch! That actually, that's, that's kind of brutal phrasing. It was at one point planned to go on Stadia, Stadia didn't survive long enough, but still. They also expected that Larian, the developer, would demand $5 million for posting the game to Game Pass. Ultimately, Baldur's Gate 3 didn't ship on Xbox, despite not being exclusive to any platform, and that's not because of Larian's choosing, necessarily. Larian actually posted in its FAQ previously that it was because they were struggling getting split-screen co-op to even work on the Xbox consoles. In the time since, Microsoft and Larian have made plans to launch on the Xbox this year, but it's fair to say that Microsoft overlooked the popularity of this title quite a bit. We'll throw one last one in here too. There's a lot more, but uh, this is a fun leaked email of Microsoft reacting to the PlayStation 5 launch. So the email thread contains things like competitive analysis about what Sony announced at its PS5 unveil, includes specifications and some internal thoughts on the market positioning of Xbox versus PlayStation. None of this is bad or anything. It's actually exactly what we would expect any company to do for competitive analysis of a product. But it is kind of interesting. Microsoft's Liz Hammond wrote a competitive analysis report of the Sony PS5 and sent it internally to the Microsoft chiefs, including Phil Spencer. And the report included commentary that, quote, it is now evident that Xbox is the clear next generation technology leader. Also noting that, quote, we have significant strength in backwards compatibility. Spencer replied to this email stating, quote, we've all lived with seven years of starting off a generation with a price and performance and messaging disadvantage to PS4 with Xbox One. You can tell that this obviously affected their performance or bothered them. Uh, the quote continued, we have a better product than Sony does, not just on hardware, but equally important on the software platform and services on top of the hardware. We have the ingredients of a winning plan. I felt the feedback from the board of directors' discussion on being too confident. Maybe this will just reinforce that perception. It, uh, it probably did. Spencer continued saying, quote, I get the need to be humbly confident, but today was a good day for us. We haven't won anything. And I know we have hard discussions about pricing, profit and loss, investments, etc. This mail isn't trying to scoop any of that. Those discussions really matter. But we can take confidence in our product truth here, and I do believe any conversation needs to start with believing in that. This was a good day for Xbox. Now, to be fair, like most executive statements, about a quarter of that means nothing. Uh, but for reference, VG Charts currently has the PS5 outselling the Xbox. Now, sales don't necessarily indicate actual performance positioning or whose quality or services or features are better, uh, but it does indicate the sales performance. In another leaked document, Microsoft noted that it planned to subsidize the Xbox Series consoles with $1.5 billion, allowing it to hit $499 and $299 price points. The console manufacturers, actually including Valve with the early Steam Deck, often subsidize their hardware pricing so that they can recoup it in publishing fees or services revenue. This isn't uncommon. Sony probably did the same, maybe with a different amount of money. Uh, Valve definitely was losing money for some of its, its uh, Steam Decks, and that's because the company's plan to make it back through publishing fees. So whether that's money they make off the back of a game sale through agreements with the developers and the publishers, or it's through something like the sale of Game Pass, the sale of internet connectivity services, 
whatever it may be, uh, that's the reason they subsidize the hardware pricing to try and make it more consumer affordable at the front end. So it's just the, the dollar amount is insane. And specifically that document talks about it being the highest they'd ever uh, subsidized hardware. Now, the leak also noted that Microsoft sees the total addressable market for gaming consoles as 200 million units per generation, which is more of just, a, it's an interesting figure to give us an indication for how big is the gaming sector. Uh, and again, that is per generation. So that'll cover it for this one. There's a lot of other stuff out there. If you see anything particularly interesting, comment it below. Maybe we'll talk about it in another hardware news episode. We have the, the current one shot already, but perhaps the next one. Uh, anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab something like one of our mod mats if you want to support us and our reporting directly. And we'll see you all next time.